What's going on, guys? Caden Cleveland here with the Oklahoma Senate. Today on our latest OK Senate on Deck podcast, the Appropriations Chairman here in the Oklahoma Senate, Senator Roger Thompson, joins President Pro Tem Greg Treat to give everybody the latest updates that's going on in budget negotiations. There's going to be a lot of focus on education uh, and a lot of other areas. We have a big emphasis on savings this year. So you're not going to want to miss this episode. Stick around, and we will be right back. All right, guys, welcome back. As I mentioned before, we are joined with Senator Roger Thompson, the Appropriations Chair here in the Senate, of course, with President Pro Tem Greg Treat. Uh, guys, thank you so much for taking the time just to give everybody an update uh, on what's going on in the budget negotiations. A lot going on here in the last few weeks of session. So, yeah, glad to be here and glad to have Roger join us today. Absolutely. Looking forward to a uh, great discussion. Absolutely. Senator Thompson, uh, um, and Pro Tem Treat, you guys have been very active uh, as of late, especially in these past few weeks and all the budget negotiations going on. Uh, uh, just a few days ago, President Pro Tem Treat announced that uh, the Senate is really looking to, uh, I guess, in, uh, invest close to $200 million into education. Not close to, $200 million. $200 million, yeah. right. Yeah. Can, you, can you all kind of walk us through real quickly what that is going to look like and what what benefits is that to, to education? Yeah, let me start off, and then I'm going to turn him over details Absolutely. for a bit. But back up for a second. Mm -hmm. um, the pro tem designee spot, so the head of the Senate gets elected in the previous session. So I really started kind of taking over some roles in mm -hmm. June uh, and appointed him as appropriations chair right around that time, Senator David as floor leader. And then it was in August that we appointed – subcommittee chairs, so the people who actually get into the details in every area and every facet of mm -hmm. state government. So literally, uh, one thing that I don't want to be missed, as you said, the last few weeks are busy on budget. The, since August of last That's year, right. yeah. we've been working on this budget we're working on. We've been trying to figure out how to get more money to the classroom. Mm -hmm. And what, what this latest announcement represents is the culmination of a lot of pencil sharpening, a lot of, of real fiscal restraint to say, no, we see your request at sixteen million. We think you can get by at nine million yep. throughout all areas of state government to put us in a position to be able to offer a bold investment in the classroom. I agree totally. Our subcommittee chairs have been outstanding. Uh, we realized, and I talked to a constituent this morning and says, well, you guys went to work in February, you're about done. Uh, no, sir. <laughs> we, we've been working year round. That's right. And we've been working hard year round. And so now that we're coming down to the, the last stretch, and again, can't say enough about our subcommittee chairs yep. and, and the great job that they've done, but also our members. And uh, when we come out with the 200 million, we need to understand this is not a leadership plan. Uh, this is a, a caucus plan. Uh, we've got our members who met for four hours the other night, met for another hour, uh, coalescing behind this plan right. because we believe in public education. We believe in a lot of other things we'll talk about this morning, but we believe in public education. And in Caden, last year, we made the largest single investment in teachers in state history. Right. And this year, we'll make the largest single investment in the classroom uh, in state history. That is amazing. That is amazing. It, it's a big deal, a really big deal. And we're also able to have some savings on the end yep. too. So uh, we're, we're nearly a billion dollars in savings at the end of this year. If you look at the, the 400 plus million that's in the rainy day fund, or no, 451 million that's right in the today, rainy day yes. fund right now, and an expected deposit of over $400 million, we're really close to a billion dollars in savings this year. And that doesn't happen by happenstance. It happens because of planning. It happens because we made tough choices over the last couple of years to put us in a position right. to be able to deliver a huge right. infusion of cash into the classroom. That's awesome. If I may, just to kind <clears> of <throat> dive into the weeds just a little bit with what is going to be done with that $200 million, or what could be done with that $200 million, um, is this is this a proposal to, um, I guess I should ask, is this, uh, with this $200 million, is there still a possibility of teacher pay raises and things like that? You mentioned it goes to classroom funding. What, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, Roger, you take that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, $200 million, and uh, we would like to see $70 million of that used for the $1,200 teacher pay raise. Okay. You know, the governor's been for that. The right. House has been for that. Uh, our caucus has been, we want to put money into the classroom. Right. And to me, this is a win-win. 
Uh, we get the 70 million that the governor and the house has asked for for the teacher pay raise, and then we get the 120 million plus that we've been asking for to go right. into the classroom. And so everybody's getting exactly what they asked for. Now, the way this works is 200 million will go into the formula, and out of that, 70 million will be used for the teacher pay raise, $1,200. Okay. So we are not changing the, the pay scale. If you're off the formula, right. it doesn't affect you at all. You're not going to have to give raises. Those schools are doing a great job. Okay. And so we appreciate that a great deal. But we believe this is going to reduce classroom size. We believe this is going to increase instructional right. material. Right. And the bottom line that our caucus is very interested in is quality of education for our students. That's good. This actually changes that course. This changes the conversation. And uh, we are really, really excited about what we're able to do. Love that. So that would be with the extra $130 million. You mentioned the $70 million is for that teacher pay raise. The rest of that $130 million can be used for things like you mentioned, getting smaller class sizes, maybe hiring new teachers. Yeah, textbooks, and how like do you that. get smaller classroom sizes? Right. You hire more teachers. Yeah. Uh, makes so, sense, right? So, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how you do it. So they're one and the same. But I, it's, this hits really close to home to me. I, I've got an 11-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 7-year-old mm -hmm. all in public school. And we get notes home every year at the beginning of session, uh, not session, beginning of school year and at the fall break saying, please send in paper. Mm -hmm. we, we, we don't have the money to pay for enough paper for right. this classroom. Please send in um, markers, dry erase markers. Please uh, make sure you, you give some money to the teacher because they're having to buy supplies. Mm -hmm. This has been a huge burden on teachers in our classrooms. Right. You hear it every day. Everywhere you go, teachers are having to put their own money into the classroom. Right. And they're doing so willingly. But we, we need to pay for uh, the basics of the school uh, experience. Wow. And to have, have these notes come home, I get this question all the time when I'm in my neighborhood. Uh, Greg, you say that you've made an investment in education, but I'm still getting the notes saying we don't have a enough paper, construction paper, copy paper, we don't have markers, we don't have staplers, we don't right. have those basic supplies wow. that you run a classroom with. Uh, why is that? Well, we've been, we gave a huge infusion of cash, but it was to teacher pay last year. We've got to get a huge infusion of cash into the classroom, and this plan does just that. But it does not deny the plan that the House and the governor have been wanting to do of $1,200. It, it also includes that. So it's a win-win for everyone. Love that. Absolutely. And that's been something that's not just uh, unique for, you mentioned the school that, that your kids go to, but that, that's a statewide deal where it's just been a uh, more more of a need for classroom funding. And uh, you, Senator Thompson, I think you mentioned that this, a $200 million would be a, a historic, uh, more of a, a one-time investment than, than it's ever been done before. Is that correct? That, that's exactly correct as far as a one-time investment. Mm -hmm. But also understand this adds to the base Ooh, okay. of our support for education. So last year in public education, we put over $2.9 billion of state money wow. into public education. Okay. This moves us to $3.1 billion, becomes the new base for public education in Oklahoma. That does not include career tech, higher ed, right. this is other, just, this common, is just common ed, uh, pre-K through 12 education. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first time in state history that education, common education funding has been above $3 billion, or $30 billion, what was the number yeah, you said? Yeah, $3.1 billion. $3.1 $3 billion. Yeah, uh, and the $3 billion, it's important to know, that's the appropriated amount. There's also Absolutely. local ad valorem dollars that come in and other off the top monies and things like that. But right. we're just talking about the appropriated amount that we get judged on as a legislature right. that we that we have direct control over. Uh, we will be making a historic investment. But be careful when you use the net, net one time. Uh, it, this is it's not this a one time is a, investment. A bump, gotcha. But this is an ongoing investment into the classroom. This would be this is not we're gonna bump it up two hundred million dollars this year. And then next year it comes back down. This is this is an increase in the baseline, as Senator Thompson. Very said. important yeah. distinction there. Yeah, exactly, Absolutely. and to put that in comparison to the rest of our budget and other agencies, the only other agency that comes close to that in state appropriated funds uh -huh. is the healthcare authority, and this year they will be a, a little over one billion dollars. <laughs> and so in common ed, we're putting three times what we're putting into the healthcare authority. And I often tell people we can have a discussion. Is this enough money for education? We can discuss that. Yeah. But we cannot have a discussion, is this a priority uh, with the Senate? Is this a priority with the legislature? It's definitely a priority. Oh, just the numbers back that up. 
Yes. Just uh, right off the top, <laughs> when you see something that's being spent three times as much as the next highest thing, I mean, common sense tells you this is the number one priority for the legislature. So. Yeah. Oh, and exactly. And as Senator Tree said a moment ago, th that's the state portion. Yes. And so we keep in mind whenever that you put the local dollars with it, federal dollars with it, we're looking at almost uh, eight point nine to nine billion dollar investment in public right. education in Oklahoma. Gotcha. Okay. Well. Um, just to shift gears, just real quickly, I want to I want to touch on something. Get y'all's input on something that's really been talked about a lot lately. Governor Stitt um, mentioned this even before session began that he wanted to put away two hundred million dollars into the rainy uh, day fund, which is essentially our state savings account. Um, can y'all kind of speak to that and and, and what, what is on track there? Yeah, I guess. And, and he hasn't enunciated where to put the money. Okay, uh, just for clarification, oh, okay, he's, he's just said that. Of the $575 million in growth, and if you add the $30 million that we clawed back from the health department, right. 605 he wants to hold back on $200 million of that. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, best of my knowledge, I don't think he said rainy day fund. Okay. The gotcha. rainy day fund does have a constitutional cap that we will get close to really, really close to hitting. It's $878 million That's is correct. the cap yes. if you take it. Uh, and so when you hear what I said earlier, 451 plus 400 if if that's above 400, we're getting really close to that cap. So uh, he he did enunciate trying to make sure that we were showed some restraint and save some of that money back for a rainy day. But I don't think it's specifically for a rainy day. Fund. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm exactly correct. And I appreciate his fiscal leadership. Absolutely. You know, if we're looking into our private lives, we need to have at least three months savings. Yep. And in the appropriated dollars, we spend 533 million dollars a month. Hmm. And so we would need at least 1.5, 1.6 billion just simply to have uh, three months savings. His goal is to have $2 billion at the end of his first uh, term. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great goal. And I also believe we must take care of the needs of the people of Oklahoma as right. we move forward. Right. But I certainly appreciate his fiscal leadership. Absolutely. And just having that mindset of wanting to uh, put some money away for savings for, uh, obviously, the economy here in Oklahoma is a little bit, you know, hills and valleys sometimes. And putting money away for uh, the next economic downturn is a wise move, wouldn't you all say? Yeah, uh, you got to make sure you balance the needs. We've yeah. got some needs Absolutely. that we've got out there, and teacher teacher uh, pay is part of the overall classroom funding. Educational funding overall is absolute priority, so right. we're trying to maximize the investment there. We've also got an area of critical shortage in uh, Department of Corrections uh, correctional officers. Oh, big, big topic right there. Yeah, and and so we're really. This, the Senate priorities in the budget really reflect where the shortage areas are, where we have the most critical needs right. in education, classroom funding, and also in correctional officers to make sure that those state employees that happen to be correctional officers at a prison, not just correctional officers, but other people behind the fence that put themselves yep. in harm's way. Uh, but we're, we're trying to make a, an investment there, too, because that is a critical shortage in our state. Wow. I think overall that's a little bit part of the criminal justice reform conversation, don't you think? Investment into our correctional officers. I mean, you all kind of speak to that a little bit? Well, there, there must be an investment in DLC. And if, yes, part of the criminal justice uh, reform. Um, as the pro tem was talking a few moments ago, if we have a shortage of correctional officers, it puts the officers that are on duty in great danger. Mm -hmm. So not only are we having a shortage because of what they're paid, the beginning salary is $13.74 an hour. Right. And you get out in western Oklahoma competing with the oil field, we're not having those. There are some of our facilities that we may have five correctional officers on duty with 1,000 inmates. We've got to move and change that dynamic. That's right. Uh, that, that's, right. that's a very dangerous dynamic. And, and right now, Secretary Keating, uh, who is over public safety, is looking for ways. What if something erupts? Well, the first thing we're going to need is make sure we've got officers on the ground. That's right. And then coordinate with the National Guard, the Highway Patrol, bringing that plan together. I think Secretary Keating is doing a great job with that. Our job is to make sure we have those employees not only hired, but we have enough of them to keep this, the uh, themselves safe, right. but also to keep the state safe. And, and to be honest with you, there, there's such a shortage of correctional officers around our, our state right. system that they're having to work a lot of overtime. Mm -hmm. And so it's bumping up the cost one and a half times the normal wage, one and a half times the normal wage, I should say. And then they're stretched thin. So when they're on duty out there walking the, the correctional facility, right. they may have worked a lot longer than they were supposed to right. uh, on their shift just to be able to, to have the right number of guards to inmates. Wow. And it, it jeopardizes their safety yep. 
the safety of others in the prison. That's right. And this is just one piece of the uh, DOC, or, or the overall corrections investment. Last year, a uh, bond was passed to try uh, to help increase the facilities, uh, upgrade some of those facilities that are in much need. Um, Senator Thompson, you were a big part of the, that uh, bond and how that played out. Can you kind of speak to that? And Absolutely. Uh, last year, the legislature uh, approved um, $116.5 million, and um, it is now uh, in action, it took a long time to go through the process right. to get the money released uh, because of uh, some bureaucracy. But the money has been released. Uh, we're now getting in the facilities, changing some uh, of the uh, chillers that need to be uh, changed out, uh, the roof, uh, repair some of the buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're in critical need right. uh, within DLC. A lot of our education space, uh, Career Tech is no longer able to be in there because we've had to use that space for beds. And so we're looking at that. We're addressing that as the best we can. The bond's been a very good thing. Uh, the DOC, they're uh, giving regular updates, monthly updates to us on what they've been able to complete so far. Great, great. But, but Kate, I don't want it to get lost. Criminal justice reform right. overall is trying to make sure that we, we have the people in prison that need to be in prison. From Absolutely. The, the, and, and get treatment to those people who uh, either have some mental health issue, drug abuse, or most oftentimes yep. co-occurring. Yep. And so while we're making these investments in prisons, that is not the ultimate goal of criminal justice reform. The ultimate goal is to start bending that curve on the population right. while maintaining public safety. And that's an extremely important caveat. You've got to make sure that everything you're doing is about getting that person back into society, right. allowing them to have a more productive life, being a taxpaying citizen and not behind uh, the prison uh, fence. That's right. And so, but the most important component is making sure you don't compromise public safety. Love that. Absolutely. And so while we're making these criminal justice reforms that are historic over the last four or five years, we've got to make sure that those people that are in prison and those people that are protecting the population by being correctional officers are not compromised as well. So it's not part and parcel of criminal justice reform. Right. Because criminal justice reform is trying to bend that curve gotcha. down. Okay on prison population, but we can't deny that we have those people in Absolutely. there now, and we can't deny the safety of those correctional officers that are working there every day. Not just, you also have psychologists, doctors, yep. dentists, yep. Uh, you have others behind that fence too that, that are uh, really putting themselves in harm's way to keep keep us safe. And you mentioned diversion programs. That's been number, the one of the top uh, four really priorities for the Senate Republicans, at least, uh, since the very start of session. So um, is that continuing to be, uh, I guess, a, a key component in the budget negotiations? Uh, absolutely. We have reached an agreement uh, with the House, and, and the governor is also excited mm -hmm. about that. That's one of his uh, leading principles is being smart on crime. Yep. And uh, a lot of that is going to get in and talk to these people who are just at the first step of getting into crime, right. whether it be in drugs or whatever misdemeanors they start out with. Right. And then let's stop the process there before okay. we ever get in. You know, we start talking about reducing our prison population. That's a lot easier to do on the front side than on the back side. Correct. And so let's get involved on the front side. Gotcha. Uh, I think you ought to talk about your bail reform a little bit too. Senate Bill 252, which some some listeners may have heard about, but uh, bail reform is a component of criminal justice reform, and Senator Thompson's led the way on that. Uh, absolutely, um, we've been in conversation with the District Attorney's Council. They're they're on board with it now, and so what we're really wanting to do is that whenever an individual is arrested, uh, that we get them before a judge uh, within uh, 48 hours. Now that's excluding weekends and holidays. Mm -hmm. And so if you mess up on Friday night, you'll see one on Monday. But nevertheless, uh, excluding weekends and holidays, and set a reasonable bail. And if a person can be released on their own uh, recognizance, right. we want them to do that. And, and the reason behind that is if, if I can be bonded out, I can go back to my job, I can go back to my family, and the evidence is clear. As soon as I can get back to my job and my family, right. the less likely I'm going to be to go off into DOC. That's right. That's right. Uh, there was a criminal court of appeals case of uh, Brill versus Gorich, uh, who says that we must have clear and convincing evidence that to hold somebody. And so we're changing from a, a preponderance of evidence to clear and convincing evidence and to make sure that we've got the right uh, evidence holding that person uh, in jail. We want lives changed. We do not want to compromise public safety. Now, I do want to say involved in this that in Title 57, it lists all the violent crimes. Right. If you're arrested for a violent crime, what I've been talking about does not apply. Gotcha. Okay. 
So as it kind of goes back to what Senator Treat said, the main thing here is make sure that public safety is maintained, which I think has been a, a question for some in this whole uh, criminal justice reform topic is that are you just going to open the floodgates and let everybody go? No, that, that's not what this is. Yeah, if you're like me and you live in the Oklahoma City metro, you pick up the paper every day and there's an issue at the, the Oklahoma County right. Jail. Right. Uh, and, you know, when these people get arrested, they're going to be at a county jail. And many of those are stretched really thin already. And having some of this bail reform make sure that we keep those people that are committing the violent crimes in there, but we're trying to get other people readjusted back to normal life. Gotcha. And for those who have a fiscal, uh, financial interest uh, in the bail process, of course, they're against this. And they've been uh, simply advertising this is a catch and release. And that's not what this is at all. Hmm. This is to make sure that we're providing justice to individuals who've been arrested. Um, you know, Senator Tree brought up a few moments ago in Oklahoma County. We had an individual that was uh, incarcerated in the county jail eight months hmm. before they ever were able to see a judge. Wow. That, that's not right. Should not happen. Is that the norm? No, but it does happen. Uh, whenever we begin to look at uh, the young lady who was arrested here a while back, spent two weeks on a yep. warrant that should have never been executed before she was able to get before a judge. Wow. Those are things that we must be able to address. Absolutely. Well, uh, so guys, kind of moving forward, uh, we talked about education, we talked about criminal justice reform, the corrections investment. Is there any other things, any other topics that you wanted to, to mention that's a, really going to be a, a key component and focus in this year's budget? I, I do want to talk about one other area, and I want to go back to savings okay. because uh, I believe it's real savings. Senator Simpson, Senator Sino, and Representative McIntyre, who works in our uh, health and human services. Mm -hmm. And so we have the up and down of our budget. And when we do, sometimes our provider rates are cut to nursing homes and to hospitals and to okay. people who really need them. And so under the leadership of those that I mentioned a few moments ago, we're able to save some of the federal matching dollars this year and uh, next year. And this year we anticipate saving $29 million. That's and so great. next time there's a downturn in our economy, That's great. we don't have to cut those provider rates. And it's going to be a, a good thing for the state of Oklahoma. That's brand new this year. And, and uh, Simpson and Racino and McIntyre have led the way in that. And so when we talk about putting $200 million in savings over here and, and we want to discount that, I, I think we do a disservice. Oh, absolutely. This is probably some of the most critical savings that you'll see this year because wow. it has a specific purpose in the future to protect the most vulnerable in our state. That's very long-term thinking. Well, it's that. innovative, and it also points to the process that we've been trying to push back or push down real decision-making authority down the chain on the subcommittees. So you've got pro tem, you've got the approach chair, you could have a top-down approach saying this is exactly what we're doing, mm -hmm. but you don't get the, those innovative ideas That's like right. that that came out of the subcommittee process that I'm extremely excited Me about. Too. Well, that's a huge deal in, in just the overall structure that you both have been uh, really wanted to do in, the, in this budgeting process. It started when uh, immediately when you became pro tem senior retreat and you appointed senior uh, – Senator Thompson as the appropriations chair, that that decision was made to put that a lot more responsibility on those subcommittee chairs. Um, so that, I think that's just really a, says a lot about just the thinking and the, and the long-term thinking that you both have had. Yeah, and they've flourished. They have flourished Absolutely. doing that. Uh, but, Kate, you said, is there anything else? I think people need to know this is not a done deal. Absolutely. What we're talking about here has not been signed, sealed, and delivered yet. Uh, we are advocating strongly for this. Okay. Uh, but I don't want people to be misled that this is delivered yet. Okay. Uh, this is the Senate perspective on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, and obviously our perspective aligns now where we've, we're on the $200 million investment. We said, yes, you, you want to have $70 million go to teacher pay? Okay. We want to make sure we prioritize classroom funding. But this is not delivered to the governor's desk yet. The gotcha. negotiations are still ongoing, and we're still working through – literally every issue we just talked about. Uh, and so don't don't think it's done yep, yet. Absolutely. We've still got to have advocacy to make sure that we get this done. Very important note there. Senator Thompson, do you have anything to, to add on that? It's been a good year. Yeah. Um, we have in the Senate uh, been given $1.162 billion worth of new expenses from the House. Uh, we've had to vet those, come down, what can we actually do with the money that we've been given right. with the priorities that the state of Oklahoma needs. Right. I am proud of every member of our chamber uh, who has stood tall and said this is where we need to be. And so as we move forward in budget negotiations, uh, we have the entire caucus behind us, 
and we're ready to move forward and close this out. Man, love that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, as Senator Treat said, I mean, these this is just the latest update in budget negotiations. As new things develop, obviously, we'll keep everybody informed with all the latest news. Um, well, guys, we're about out of time. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Senator Thompson? Kind of. No, sir. Just there. thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Glad to be at the table. Thank you for joining us, Senator Treat. This has been a tremendous session. We have an opportunity to finish stronger than we've ever been, and yes. I'm excited. I'm very excited going into Absolutely. this next week. Absolutely. Well, hey, guys, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, new thing, we mentioned it last week, but our, our uh, on-deck podcast is now available on iTunes. All you have to do to find the iTunes podcast is go on to iTunes, search Oklahoma Senate Republicans, and press subscribe. Leave us a review on there. Um, give us a five-star rating if you wouldn't mind. That would be really cool. Um, other than that, uh, you, if you have any direct questions for us here on the podcast, you can email us at ondeck at OKSenate.gov. And uh, beyond that, Senator Treat, any last words? Nope. Thanks, Caden. Appreciate oh, it. Awesome. Thanks, Senator Thompson. Senator Thompson, thank you again for joining us. Have a good day. And guys, we'll see you next week. Bye.